All right, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be with you again. Give greetings to the saints there in Rochester, New York. All right, so I'm going to go to uh, share screen mode as I did last week. And I'll keep a little picture up this week so you can kind of see me as I talk. All right, so last week we were looking at the subject of wisdom for parents. And um, it was really lovely to go through some of the Proverbs with you and then uh, provide some equipping ministry for husbands being better husbands and wives being better wives. Uh, some resources uh, from the presentation last week. By the way, I'm, I'll be uh, emailing the PowerPoint uh, to the focal point there at Northgate. So you'll have that as a resource after the, the message today. Um, my books, The Fruitful Vine, Celebrating Biblical Womanhood, and also um, The Fruitful Bow, Affirming Biblical Manhood, would have some of the same material in it. Uh, this morning, I'll be sharing from some things from the book, The All of Plants Raising Spiritual Children. My wife and I were talking about this topic, and I said, I really appreciate your prayers. I always get a little nervous when I'm talking about marriage and uh, raising children. She says, yes, it's a very humbling topic. And so, um, but God's word really gives us the, the benefit of, doesn't leave us destitute of wisdom in what he expects for marriage and what he expects for raising children. So our study this morning is wisdom for parents. These were the assigned verses uh, for them. And I'll, I'll just read them and then make some cursory comments, train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's Proverbs 22, 6. Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. And then Proverbs 23, 13 through 14, do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with the rod and deliver his soul from hell. And then Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now, when I first read through these verses, I thought if there were any children in this session, they might get a little scared because there's a lot of the rod here. And um, it is true that the rod is part of the training process but what I hope to do this morning is, is broaden uh, our concept of what it means to train up a child in the way he should go. Now, my mom was from Mississippi, and there was no rod in, in our home when we grew up. It was a switch. And uh, I hated those words, go get you a switch, go get you a switch. And I remember one time coming back with about a little six-inch twig, <laughs> thinking I had one up on my mom. And, she about beat me to death with that thing. And so I never did that again. But the, the idea is a, a means of corporal punishment. And it, it is important for children to learn at an early age that there's consequences to rebellion and sin. And if they learn it early, hopefully that will be a guide to them later not to rebuff and rebel against authority. So just some uh, highlights from uh, these four verses. Children need to be trained in the way they should go. They are born naturally foolish. I don't care if it's your fools or my fools. Um, children are born foolish. Uh, and so there needs to be a training process in order to mold and shape them for the Lord. We're not to withhold correction from a child. And uh, children do need to be disciplined and corrected promptly. Um, not always with the rod, but there should be the exhortation, admonishing, and so forth. I'd like to start with a question. What is a Christian home? C.H. McIntosh answers this question with a question. Now, the question for the Christian's parents conscience really is, am I counting upon God for my house and ruling my house for God? A solemn question, surely, yet it is to be feared. Very few feel its magnitude and power. And so I want to think with you right up front about what a Christian home is. It's not a house full of Christians. It's not a home where a bunch of believers live. 
it's a household that Christ rules over. He and his word have precedence in that home. So it's not just Christ living in all family members, but where all the family live for Christ and obey his word. And then just thinking about children from God's perspective, I think sometimes parents get the wrong idea about their children, that they own them, they can do whatever they want with them. But from God's perspective, children are born to him, Ezekiel 16, 20, which means parents are stewards of their children, not owners of their children. And that's a humbling thing <clears throat> to think that of all the things the Lord trusts us with, almost everything will, will rust, corrode, degrade, but children have eternal souls. And so it's really the highest stewardship. God has entrusted parents with something eternal. And I think there's great consequences for not taking that stewardship um, very carefully, very seriously. And then secondly, children are a heritage or a provision to parents, especially in olden times, children were needed to labor. Um, they were also a defense against attack. And Psalm 127.3 tells us that they are a reward from the Lord. So they're both a heritage and a reward from the Lord. Then children must be trained for the Lord. I think I actually had this verse, these verses um, on a slide just so we wouldn't have to look them up. Psalm 127, three through five. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hands of a warrior. So are children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So children need to be trained up. Uh, they're likened to arrows. Um, arrows need to have straightened shafts and they need to have very sharp points or arrowheads in order to be effective as an arrow. Um, when I was still in engineering, we lived on a farm at, in Rockford, Illinois. We had some cattle and we had chickens and so forth. And it was a great place for the kids to grow up. They had responsibilities and I remember one time our son, Matthew, he was probably seven or eight. He had one of those little 10 pound fiberglass um, bows and he had some arrows and he was shooting at a straw bell outside the barn. And uh, he yelled at me, he said, hey dad, come look at my crazy arrow. And uh, so I walked over and he shot it and this arrow just went right into the ground. It didn't even hit the straw bell. And he started laughing. He said, see, Dad, this is my crazy arrow. And I said, son, bring me that arrow. I want to show you something. And so he brought it to me, and I rolled that arrow in my hand, and the shaft was very curved. I said, this is a crazy arrow, but I don't want you to shoot it anymore because you don't know where it's going to go. And it could do a lot of damage. It could hit a chicken or an animal, one of the farm animals. And uh, so he agreed, and that was just a solemn reminder that our children are born foolish in heart, and they have to be, uh, those bents have to be straightened through a very uh, aggressive and consistent training program. Um, now, I've included uh, a passage out of Ephesians 6, 4. The first four verses in chapter 6 tell us about um, that the home life, children are to obey their parents in the Lord. And then verse four, uh, it says, fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And I like this word training. It's a Greek word, paideia. We also find it in 2 Timothy 3.16, when we find out that the word of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And in some of your translations, that would be uh, rendered training in righteousness. Now, paideia is a multifaceted word. It means to exhort, correct, to teach. It has um, all different kinds of aspects, reproof, correction. It's the same word that Pilate uses in Luke, I think it's 22, when he says, I'll chastise the Lord. Well, he's speaking of scourging him. 
So it does have a connotation of train by pain also, but it's much bigger than that. And so I would suggest that in training children, that if, if we're doing it correctly, there's going to be a lot of instruction, um, a lot of exhortation. Exhortation means to come alongside and to turn. Someone, the child is heading off a little bit in the wrong direction and you just come alongside very gently and say, you know, son, if you keep going that direction, you're gonna get in trouble. And here, you just turn a little bit, there you go. That's exhortation. And we need that, all of us need that. Hebrews three tells us that we need it daily. Uh, then there's encouragement, which means to add energy to. They're already going the right direction, but give them a that a boy or that a girl to keep them on that straight path, strengthen their resolve to do what's right. So, um, there is uh, admonish, that's just a mild reproof. Uh, there is correction, and sometimes the rod of reproof needs to be applied. Uh, or as my dad would put it, the board of education to the seat of learning. And uh, he, he used the paddle. My mom had the switch. We had it covered on both ends. So uh, training is very important. Uh, it's a multifaceted, um, very exhaustive uh, toolbox uh, that parents have a lot of different kinds of tools in to properly train their children. The idea is that as we straighten their bents that they're born with and then sharpen the, the heads of the arrows with the word of God and steal God's word in them, that in the coming day when the when the father pulls back and he lets go the arrow, it flies straight and true and it, and it provides a penetrating blow to a dark world that desperately needs to see Jesus Christ. And so that's the goal of Psalm 127 um, for when we're talking about uh, training children uh, and then having them likened to Aaron's and arrows in the father's quiver. Um, I'm a bow hunter, so I know about bows, arrows, and quivers, and uh, I can tell you that a quiver doesn't have a specific size. I carry different amounts of arrows depending on what I'm hunting, and so uh, whatever your quiver full is, praise the Lord and be faithful to train up those children. Now, it's interesting that a lot of the children's books, training's books that are out there today focus on raising moral children, and that's important. Uh, very few books uh, spend time exploring the subject matter of raising spiritual children. And that's what the Lord wants. We saw that last week from Malachi chapter 215. God isn't just interested in uh, children. He wants godly seed or godly children for him. Again, we are stewards to give him what he wants. and He wants godly children. I would suggest that children... Um, there's five areas of development that parents need to be um, cognizant of. There's the moral development, development, physical, spiritual, emotional, and academic. Now, uh, my wife and I uh, were involved with homeschooling our children from, from kindergarten all the way through high school. Uh, when I left engineering, went full-time work, uh, full-time work in homeschooling worked wonderful together because I got to be with my children during the day and often many evenings I was out. And so around August, uh, Brenda and I would, we'd take a date night and go out somewhere that was quiet. And we would talk over each of our four children and we would go through each of these five areas and try to think through where they were strong and weak. Um, our four children are vastly different. And if you have several children, your children are vastly different also. Um, Kate and Matthew are visual learners. Trey is an auditory learner. Kelsey's a kinesthetic and visual learner. Different types of learning. Um, and they have different bents that need to be taken care of. They have different struggles um, academically. I sat down with our son Trey for two years, pretty much every day for two years again through Algebra 1, Algebra 2. Um, the two older children hardly needed any help. They were visual learners, they got it. Uh, Trey is naturally gifted in music. He excelled in that area. And so 
put a plan together that mom and dad can agree on for each child. And then uh, it was just a lovely time to sit down with each child privately and talk through uh, these five areas. And then also what giant to slay, which I'll speak on in just a minute and have a plan for that year of how to, to meet the child's needs and then also encourage where they're strong. This one thing I would like to say about Proverbs 22, six, which I read earlier, I don't believe that that verse promises godly parents, godly children. I do believe that it gives parents hope that if they raise the children up to the Lord and plant God's word in the child's heart at an early age, that that will act as a gyroscope, always bringing them back to the Lord. They can rebel against it. They have a free will, but they'll always have something within them that's going to be trying to turn them back to the Lord. And so that's a great hope for all of us parents. We do our best. Um, I looked over the years, many mistakes. We learn from those. We often chuckle on the first child, um, a learning experience. And the time we get to the number three or four, we we're doing a little better on some things. Uh, parents are responsible, Lord, for training their children. Uh, Judges 2, 8 through 12, uh, gives us uh, a good illustration of where parents did not take raising their children up to the Lord seriously. Uh, this was after Joshua died and that generation associated with Joshua died. The parents did not teach their children about Jehovah God. They didn't pass down the stories. They didn't pass down his law that was given at Sinai. And uh, the next, the following generation, they grew up and they didn't know the Lord. Incredible tragedy given all the Lord did for the Israelites and bringing them out of slavery, bringing them out of Egypt, um, making a personal covenant with them, calling them a peculiar people from all the earth. And um, the next generation didn't know the Lord and it grieved the Lord's heart. And so in Judges 3, uh, the Lord says, well, I'm going to teach them about me, but it's going to be through war. It was a painful process. So God made the next generation uh, aware of himself that there were much consequences for not knowing the Lord. Uh, this illustration, this illustrates the fallacy of depending on outside influences to maintain uh, the family's spiritual welfare. Uh, through the years, I've often heard parents say, well, I'm going to bring my children to church so they can be trained for the Lord. Well, it's true that the church meetings and the elders and those that are shepherds within the meeting can help parents train their children, but the, the role, the ones that the, the Lord holds accountable are parents to train their children. And we already know that a companion of fools will be destroyed. A companion of the wise will be wise. A companion of fools will be foolish. And we read earlier in Proverbs 22, 15, that foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. So it doesn't matter if it's my fools or your fools, putting a bunch of fools together is not going to have a good outcome. It wasn't God's uh, intention of raising children that way. Um, parents are to raise their children, are to train them. I, obviously, there are different school choices today, and uh, parents have to go before the Lord and decide what's best. But uh, putting a, a number of fools together is not going to have a good outcome. Children will cost us everything. They cost us our time, our money, our strength. It's a huge responsibility. It's important stewardship. And so we're going to expend a lot of our time and resources in doing it. And if we neglect doing it, Satan will be right there. Children are like sponges. They're going to absorb whatever he wants to put into them. So with that said, I think Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7 makes it pretty clear. And now again, this is speaking to the nation of Israel and their homes. But parents were to use teachable moments throughout the day to apply God's word. The time they raised up through the day, when they laid down, uh, they ate. And uh, the only way you can do that is if one of the parents is with the children through the day. So taking those teachable moments, applying God's word, seeing the events that need to be correct in real time, providing timely correction, admonition, encouragement, 
uh, it really necessitates one of the parents being with the children uh, through the day. All right, so the rest of our time together, I just want to try to do some equipping ministry, some ideas for raising spiritual children. Um, what is the goal of spiritual development? Well, the first case is witnessing one's children trust the Lord Jesus for salvation. And so at an early age, we start telling them about the gospel. We start telling them about the Lord Jesus. We show them what sin is, how it grieves the Lord. And um, the first thing that we want to see is our children one to Christ. Once they have the Holy Spirit, then the transformation process of being conformed to the moral glory of the Lord Jesus begins. And so it's, it's good just to keep um, reiterating at a child's level what the gospel is. I actually was led to the Lord by my mother through a little track called the Four Spiritual Laws. And I can still remember some of the pictures that were in that track as she was explaining uh, the Four Spiritual Laws to me. And it's uh, a real delight to see the children come to Christ. I can remember um, Kate and Matthew came to Christ at a pretty early age. And I can remember one morning getting up, taking a shower, getting ready to go into work. It's when I was still in engineering. And uh, Trey uh, got up early. He was probably three years old. He was still in his Winnie the Pooh one-piece pajamas. And as I was shaving, he came in the door and he was just looking at me. And uh, he he said, "Dad, does Kate have salvation or salvation?" And I looked down and I said, "Yes, I think." Uh, Kate knows the Lord Jesus as her savior and I kept shaving and then he said does Matthew Jordan have salvation and I knew where this was going and I looked down at him again and said yes I think Matthew's trusted Jesus Christ as his savior and then the question came that I was expecting does Michael Trey have salvation and that's when I put the razor down. I got on his level and it just as um, gently and as carefully as possible in, in words that a three-year-old could understand, I again explain the gospel message. Now, it was a few years later that he finally came to Christ. Um, he made a few professions, but he got his assurance he was about eight years old. But it was a fun process seeing the little lights come on as the word of God and the spirit of God work on we souls. All right, some ideas for raising spiritual children. Uh, point two, encourage daily quiet times. What we found helpful is when the children were learning to read fairly well, around about the age of seven, uh, we would give them a readable um, version of the Bible, um, a, a nice solid paraphrase, something that they could understand. Um, Obviously, they're going to grow into a literal translation a bit later when they get older, but we think it's important for them to understand what they're reading. And then I would give them a spiral notebook and ask them to, I said, I'm not going to tell you how much to read each day, but I just want you to write down what you read, the passages, the date, and just one thought about the Lord or one thought of application that you got from God's word. <clears throat> and then I'll sit down with you once a week. And I want to see what God is showing you from, from the Bible. And so I would do that for six months, meet with them once a week. And then I would go every other week for six months. And then once a month for the next year. So there was two years of accountability. And uh, it's lovely to see the children as they grew up in adolescence and adult years continue with their daily quiet times. Most of them still journal. Um, now with homeschooling, this was um, very profitable because any misspelled words in their quiet time notebooks, I circled and that went on their spelling tests. So again, this was a cooperative thing with academics as well as spiritual training. And as I look back, those are some of my most memorable times with my children is to look at their books and see what the Lord was showing them from the scripture. I remember Kate one time when she was around seven, she was reading Leviticus. 
And she said, Dad, the Bible has a lot to say about skin disease. I said, well, that's true. <laughs> so uh, again, that's something that will encourage daily quiet times, uh, feeding on the word of God daily, uh, encourage children to fulfill gender roles. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, boys, men need to be providers for the family, so it's good for them to do physical labor, um, be groomed for the spiritual role within the assemblies. Uh, one of the things we found very helpful is we would give um, one of our sons one night a week to lead family devotions, usually after dinner, and uh, the other son another night. And that started around the age of nine or 10. And at first, the devotions lasted between 10 and 15 seconds. They would basically read a verse, just make a little comment, and that was it. That was fine. And then you can give encouragement for the things that are good, and maybe just a little feedback. So the next time, maybe you can add a little setting. Tell us about what's happening in the passage that you're getting ready to read. And uh, what we found is after a year or two of that, of standing up in front of the family and sharing from God's word, that the devotion started to get longer. They started to get meatier. Then we saw the boys standing up and praying uh, in the chapel prayer meetings. And before long, they were sharing regularly in the Lord's Supper. So the home is a great place to help um, young men to learn to stand up and speak in front of others in a non-threatening way. Um, environment. Uh, daughters need to be taught to how to care for children and care for the home, preparing uh, nutritious meals. I can tell you in pre-marriage counseling, uh, I find very few men or women these days that know how to cook or care for a home. So this is very important training. Um, daughters can plan and prepare one evening meal per week or breakfast, plan the ingredients, learn to make a menu, a shopping list. Um, these, this is good training. Brenda was very careful to train all the children and how to clean toilets and how to do dishes and how to do laundry. So that's just good training. Um, again, to help them when they, they leave the nest and start on their own. Preparing for the Lord's Supper. Um, this is very important. It's a joy to remember the Lord each week together. Uh, it's not something that we rush into. There's preparation. And so it's important to teach children to confess sin. Um, normally on Saturday evenings, I go around to each of the children and just remind them tomorrow we're going to remember the Lord. You need to have your sins confessed. And do you have an offering for the Lord? And uh, it's important for every man and woman and child that's saved to come to the Lord's Supper uh, with something to offer the Lord. Now, God has an order. Um, the sisters have a, a ministry of concealing competing glories as a visual ministry. The brothers have an audible ministry. Uh, those are the roles that God gives within the assembly. But what the brother is sharing doesn't go past the back door or the ceiling tile. What the worship is what comes from the heart. And so it's very important for um, men, women, children who are believers to have an offering to give to the Lord. I can't tell you how many times my wife and children through the years have come up to me after the Lord's Supper and said, thanks, Dad, for sharing my verse. And I was thinking of these thoughts also. And what encouragement it is to a, a daughter who's been meditating uh, all week for a thought about the Lord's Supper to hear a man share exactly what she's been meditating on. And that shows her two things. First of all, that God is listening to her heart. And second of all, that man is speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, a couple of years ago, my wife said, you got to see this. It was a little black book. I had never seen it before. And I said, what's that? She goes, this is Kelsey's Breaking of the Bread Journal. And it went back for years. She had entries for every Sunday, um, passages, thoughts about the Lord's Supper, a song, a poem, takes it very seriously. Often she would go into her room on Saturday evenings 
and lock the door, uh, to stay in her room for an hour or two preparing her thoughts for the Lord's Supper. It's a great encouragement to the sisters to hear uh, the men share what they've been meditating on uh, before the Lord. Children need to learn the difference between praise and worship. Um, I remember one time talking to Kate about this on a Saturday evening. She had a great thought of praise for the Lord's Supper. And I asked her, I said, Kate, um, you remember that handkerchief that you gave me as a gift and you embroidered uh, a nice design on it? And she said, yeah, I remember that. I said, which sounds better to you? Kate, thank you so much for this gift. It's very pretty. I like the colors and everything. Or Kate, thank you for this gift. I can tell this took you a long time to do it. And I really like the colors. She goes, well, I like the second one. I said, why? She said, well, because it talks about what I did, not the gift. I said, well, that's the difference between praise and worship. Praise acknowledges the goodness of God, but worship looks into the heart of God. Why did he give what he gave? Um, and we only get that from digging in the word, understanding the, the goodness and the character, um, the blessing of knowing such a, a wonderful savior. So children need to understand um, it's easy just to get thanksgiving and praise, but worship takes a little more effort and digging to understand why God does what he does. Uh, removing child erected idols, these are naturally going to come up. Um, we all have a carnal nature. Uh, children, if they learn discipline early in life, it'll help them all the way through their life. And so uh, that will require limits on non-spiritual reading, computer time, internet time, music limits. I'm not going to tell you what those limits should be. As parents, you'll have to work that out. And the idea is not to be heavy-handed, uh, but to teach discipline. For example, for uh, computer time. When the children were growing up, they could have uh, a half an hour, depending on their age, or maybe an hour of computer time for non-educational, non-spiritual type of things. And they had little timers. And if we would go by and, and uh, their timer wasn't on, they were done for the day. And so they would hit their timer. And then when it dinged, they would learn the discipline of stopping, being cognizant of how much time they spent in stopping. And that's the value, is learning what we're doing and to stop doing it and learning balance in life. And so children need to learn that at an early age. Again, it's not being heavy handed. You're just teaching them to be aware of how much time they're spending on things. Our daughter, Kate, could she spread thousands and thousands of books. She could read hours and hours every day. And so we had to put limits on her uh, to not read so many more hours in a day, just so she would learn not to exhaust herself in an out of balance uh, character bent. Um, reading's good, but if it's out of balance, then other things get neglected. And it's good for children to learn that early on. Remove the influence of anything or anyone that's hindering spiritual growth. Usually when there's a wilted olive plant, uh, it's an influence. It's either something where someone is hindering their spiritual growth. And if you can find out what that is and remove it, and then apply the word of God and the things that help children um, to grow as God wants them, then they perk up and, and they recover pretty quickly. Uh, teach to pause and pray. Um, when difficulties come, pause and pray. Uh, I don't know how many times through years I've been convicted. Um, I think it's easier for men when things get tough, the tough get going, and we don't um, uh, quickly go to prayer as our wives do. Uh, my wife's example has been convicting many times through the years, and I think it's good for children to learn at an early age. When, when things get tough, we have no strength here. We need the Lord, and so we go to our great high priest in heavenly places. We rest in him. We ask him for help, and then when the blessing comes, we need to pause and praise the Lord, too. Uh, train, don't entertain. Um, train, don't entertain or be trained during church meetings. This would be to parents with younger children. I just note uh, the whole church came together, 1 Corinthians 14, 23. There's a number of passages 
uh, in the New Testament that show that the church gathered together. I think it's good to have children within the meeting. Um, I personally don't mind a baby that's crying and uh, cooing and so forth. It just reminds the whole assembly that we're a family. Babies are part of body life, family life. But children need to be trained. So I would suggest for, four, for the smaller children, just a four-step process. Uh, teach the child to be quiet first, uh, to set. Um, and that can be done at a fairly early age. Um, give them a warning if they're very young and then maybe kind of pinch their leg a little bit, secondary warning. And if it comes to a point uh, that you have to take them out um, make it painful, and then bring them right back in. Uh, through the years, I've seen a number of parents where they've got children acting up, and they take them to the nursery. Well, if I got to play with all the toys I wanted to play with, I would make a big scene every Sunday. I mean, that's just our carnal nature, right? So don't let the children train the parents. We, the parents need to train the children. So uh, our kids knew that if they got taken out of the meeting, um, it would be painful. Tell them, okay, that's enough crying. Uh, continue crying is just another form of rebellion. And they would come back in and sit down. And uh, they weren't going to get out of the meetings by acting up. And so we shouldn't take them out of the meetings or reward them for bad behavior. And then teach the child to sit quietly. And third, to listen and digest messages. And this can be done even at an age of seven or eight. Sometimes this um, can start with drawing a picture about what they heard. They can't write. Uh, then just three thoughts that they got from the message. Um, as families are traveling home from the church meetings, this is a good time to go over the messages with the children. What did you think about this? What did you get out of it? And so you're teaching them to listen and digest at an early age. And then as they get older, teach them uh, to take meaningful notes and uh, give them a little accountability to say, hey, I'd like to see what notes you took from this morning's message. Do you have any questions about uh, the message today? Confess sin specifically sometimes when children are caught in sin, they'll say, sorry. Well, what are you sorry for? Um, they need to confess their sin, repent of it, turn from it. And so as they hear themselves confess the sin specifically, it just helps strengthen their resolve against doing it again. Uh, slay the giant. Um, I told you about the annual meetings that Brenda and I would have usually in August for our kids. And we would pick one bent um, that we felt really need to be worked on that year, uh, a weakness to overcome. And then when we sat down with each of the children privately, we would say, this is where we'd like to take you this, this year. Do you have any thoughts? And this is a giant we think you need to slay this year. And uh, generally, they would, they would agree and be excited uh, about maybe overcoming something that had been a hindrance for them. And it was wonderful each year to see the children as we're being making them mindful of the bent and constantly and immediately giving that exhortation or encouragement when they did right, in each case, they overcame the bent. They slayed that giant uh, that year. Another uh, point I think is important is engage in evangelism, start at an early age. I, I can remember in the early days, we broke up into three groups. My wife had Trey, he was like five. Um, Matthew and Kate were a team, they were like nine and 10. And then I had Kelsey, who was just a baby. And we just leapfrog. And so even at ages of nine and 10, um, the children were knocking on doors and giving out gospel tracts and sharing their faith with people. Um, nursing homes, rescue missions, handing out tracts on trips, backyard uh, clubs, after school clubs. This has been a huge ministry uh, that my wife has been involved in. The, last 17, 18 years, the kids have been involved all the way up. And uh, it was wonderful to give them opportunities to interact with children and share the gospel through the years. I think this is one of the best opportunities we have today in evangelism as the after school clubs. Uh, for us, it's provided great opportunities, leads for 
uh, both parents and grandparents. And not only has we have the privilege of seeing children come to Christ through the clubs, we've had the privilege of seeing parents and grandparents come to Christ also. So uh, engage in evangelism. And then when they go to college, it'll be a natural thing uh, for them to want to engage in evangelism. I remember one time when Trey was in junior college, he had classes in the morning and he had a, a break for the afternoon classes. And he sometimes he'd go out and do door to door work and handing out uh, tracks and then come back to class. He told me one time he had an embarrassing situation that he knocked on the door and it was a, a, a girl in his English class. So that was a little awkward, but uh, praise the Lord that he, he wanted to exercise um, and give uh, the gospel message out. So we're winding up now just with a couple quotes uh, back to the Christian home. Hudson Taylor writes, if your father, your mother, your sister and brother, if the very cat and dog in your house are not happier for you being a Christian, it is a question whether you really are. And Oswald Chambers writes, the greatest benefits God has conferred on human life, fatherhood, motherhood, childhood, home, become the greatest curse that Jesus Christ is not the head. Um, Psalm 127, verse 1, a very important verse, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Again, a Christian home is where the Bible and its author is a center of family life and all home affairs. And we really need his help, especially in the dark days we live in, to build our homes up for his honor and his glory. Father, we just thank you for our study today. Um, it's really humbling to, to talk on this subject matter. And um, I pray, Father, that for those uh, families who have, uh, that are listening and have children at home, that, that you would really encourage them in a special way today. Uh, Father, if there's been any conviction, I pray that there would be action upon it. If there's been encouragement. We give you thanks for that. Father, we, we need strong homes. We need strong marriages. We need children that are respectful to authority as unto you, uh, that can be those sharp arrows with straight shafts that can have this penetrating blow in a dark world for the cause of Christ. So this is our our, our prayer, Father, help us to raise up our children, help us to uh, encourage our grandchildren uh, to go on for you, that they might be these bright, shining lights in a dark world. For your honor and glory, we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.